good evening and good morning, everyone, depending on where you're watching. I'm Natalie Nagalinga. I'm a curator of botany at the California Academy of Sciences. Usually during the day, what I'm doing is working on plant conservation of a really endangered group of plants called cycads. But tonight I am your host for our nightlife themed around humans and nature. And we're going to be exploring this through photography, animal rescue, art, science and music. And we are absolutely live. I'm coming to you from my lounge room, usually on, on, on the other side watching along with all of you. Um, so please drop us a comment, let us know where you are, and I'm gonna do some shout outs tonight. So tonight is the taster of a live stream that we're gonna do on Tuesday, the 22nd of September at 5 p.m. Pacific time. We're gonna be on YouTube and Facebook, just like tonight. And we're gonna be featuring the big picture photography competition. And you can check out the photos on bigpicturecompetition.org. Um, and that live stream will feature a panel of photographers, um, some of the photos, um, and some extreme photography. But tonight, um, I'm going to tell you about uh, the, how scientists are involved in the big picture competition. Um, and just to start off, I wanted to tell you about my favourite image from this year's competition. Um, and this was taken by a fellow Aussie, a photographer also from Victoria um, in Australia where I'm from. Um, and he photographed a koala in, um, who was about to be rescued during the massive, massive bushfires that we had um, in uh, Australia earlier in the year. And it really shows to me how humans care for nature. Uh, and we have a team of people who are about to rescue this koala from the approaching fires. With the fires that are happening here in the west coast of the US, it reminds us of all the efforts that are going on right now um, to save human life and also wildlife as well. So this was an entrant in the humans and nature category. And in fact, the winner of this category uh, is Jack Wonderly, who is here with us tonight. And he partnered with the animal rescue organization, Wild Care. And so he'll be talking about his winning photograph and he'll talk to Melanie Piazza from Wildcare as well. And so over to you, Jack and Melanie. Thank you, Natalie. I, I, um, I love that koala photo as well. And it's so timely with what's going on with the fires. Um, I'm honored to be here. I appreciate being here with the Academy and also uh, humbled and honored to have won first place in the human nature category of the big picture competition. Uh, I'm here tonight to talk about the winning photograph, why it's important, and also uh, take you back behind the scenes and show you how um, we created it, how, how this came about. In this image are 232 animals that were injured and later died after being attacked by a domestic cat. They were brought to Wild Care's Animal Hospital in San Rafael over one calendar year. There are approximately 100 million pet cats in America. Many of them go outside, of course, and many of them hunt. If half the cats in America went outside and killed one animal a week, about 2 billion animals would die annually. And that's exactly what happens. Cats kill an estimated 2.4 billion birds each year in the United States, along with billions of other animals. If we turned this image into a poster, you would need to print 10 million of them to see the actual death toll. Fortunately, there are some very effective and simple ways that we can reduce that number. And Melanie from Wild Care will help us uh, learn more about that in a few minutes. But let me take you through the process, <clears throat> excuse me, of creating the photo and how I got involved. As a photographer, my job, my dream job, is often to get in front of some of the most amazing sites and subjects and hopefully be there when the light is just right. So this is a Amazon rainforest sunrise on just the right day. Or this light was great on this leopard with its prey in its mouth um, in South Africa. Sometimes I have to bring a little bit of equipment with me. So this pangolin I photographed for Wild Wonders of China was using an external light we took lights all the way to Singapore for that. And then here's a lizard that I photographed in a studio for Nat Geo Kids. Or here's a snow leopard cub that I photographed to raise money for conservation. 
When we get into this subject of cats, house cats killing animals, um, I, I've been accused along the way of um, being anti-cat. That is not at all the case. I can assure you I'm a cat fanatic. Um, sometimes the subject matter though, isn't as beautiful uh, when it starts out as the images that I've just showed you. And it's my job to dig deep into the photographer's bag of tricks and try to make some art out of what I have to work with. So when I heard my friends at Wildcare were looking for a photographer to take photos of a couple hundred frozen, maimed and deceased animals, I thought, wow, this is a, um, this is a fantastic creative challenge. On Sundays, I volunteer with my daughter at another wildlife rescue in Sonoma County. And part of our work there is helping care for a group of domestic animals. They have uh, sheep, goats, chickens, and even house cats. And we use those animals and their enclosures to teach the public about how to protect your pets from wildlife, but also how to protect wildlife from your pets. So I was unaware of the staggering numbers that are created by cat predation when I first talked to wild care, but the issue of cats killing birds and other animals was something that I was already aware of. And having had the chance to travel abroad and cover some conservation issues, I learned that wildlife conflict is generally the same everywhere you go. It simply comes down to being savvy about how our choices impact the environment and the other animals around us. The photo shoot itself was Wild Care's idea. They get credit for organizing this um, and realizing that the subject matter that we're talking about was lacking of uh, imagery. We needed to put faces and some numbers to um, give perspective to the subject matter. My job was to figure out how to take a photo that was compelling and wouldn't cause revulsion and would stir up some conversation. So the day before the photo shoot, um, Melanie and Wildcare retrieved all the animals. They removed them from their tiny body bags and started thawing them out. They're not pretty when they're frozen. Um, I can assure you that it's, it wouldn't have been a good photo if we had photographed them that way. All the animals were brought to the museum at Wildcare and we cleared the space and got to work. Our time was limited as the animals needed to thaw to the point of being soft and like, like, lifelike, but not completely warm and limp, or they would start bleeding and losing fluids. Um, Melanie, who cared for many of these animals when they came in, had to, you know, in some cases, triage them all over again. She had to bandage them up and, and um, make them look as best that she could. And she became mortician and groomed the animals uh, literally like one by one for hours and tried to make them look their best. We wanted them to look lifelike. So the reason we're trying to do this is to, um, once they get frosted, to get them to look in a more natural way to show their true beauty um, and also to hopefully get people to connect with the birds. If you just see a frozen blob, you're not going to connect or realize as much as when it actually looks like the robin that you might see in your backyard. They're just all beautiful animals, and it's harder to see, of course, when they're they're deceased and <laughs> and defrosting. But so we want to make them look as as good as we can, so people really connect with the photo and the lives lost that we're talking about. From the photographic standpoint, I set out large white sheets on the floor. I mounted my camera to an overhead pole, which was connected on a Wi-Fi signal to a tablet so that I could control the camera without having to reach or try to get over the top of the animals. Um, and then I put up some very large studio lights. And then I got to work putting the animals on the floor. I had brainstormed ideas for weeks beforehand, and I knew what I wanted. I was trying to get some symmetry, but keep it organic. I wanted rows, but I didn't want it to be rigid. And when I saw the orange wings on the northern flicker bird, I knew that I would start there. That photo needed a visual anchor point. It took many hours to arrange them on the floor, and as the animals thawed and started bleeding onto the white fabric, this was a one-shot deal. I couldn't rearrange the animals once we got going. The setup took about seven hours and photography took about two hours. Slide. Okay. In my time, this is the overhead camera view. In my time volunteering at Wildlife Rescue, I'd handled dead animals before, but I'd never you know, been impacted by the sheer number and variety of animals like this. You know, there are 
There were Anna's hummingbirds, the hooded orioles, the golden crowned sparrow, purple finches, cedar waxwing, morning doves, jackrabbit, hoary bats, voles. And knowing that they all died from the same cause, a largely preventable one, was um, very touching and sad. And I was also deeply moved by the fact that almost every day of the year, somebody in the community had the heart to pick up an animal that was injured by their own cat and drive it to wild care and ask for help. And that's where Melanie comes in. Melanie is the director of animal care at Wild Care in San Rafael. She's been taking care of animals and rehabbing them for 20 years. She helps with um, not only animals that come in, but animals that they have on site as education animals. She works on some of the educational outreach. And Melanie, this was really your brainchild, your baby. So thank you. Um, can you tell me, like, I don't know, when when did this start? When did this come on your radar? How long have you been percolating this? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jack and uh, Cal Academy for having us. Um, yeah, this was, um, I've been thinking of this for years, honestly. Um, just because I've been in this field for a little over 20 years, um, when I started uh, at an animal shelter that was also a wildlife hospital, I would get both the cats and the dog, or cats and the wildlife caught um, and see both sides of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's just been years of wanting to do something and knowing what I had in my mind, but not having the, not having the equipment or the skill that obviously you have um, to make it be something that people would want to look at and that would be striking like you've already explained um but mm -hmm. not revolting to people we wanted to um, open discussions and get people to think of this and talk of this talk about this topic um but not turn them away and like you had mentioned the same thing is very much one of my goals um it's to not have people feel like we're demonizing cats or cat owners i too right love I foster for many groups, um, and it's it's not about that. That it's about just getting people to realize what's happening and learn that there are ways that they can change their behaviors to make a positive change. I was so surprised at how um, passionate the replies to this topic are. Like when I posted these photos on social media, there were millions of views and hundreds of thousands of engagements, and people were commenting and arguing passionately for. Oh, they're just natural cats doing their thing. That's just how they are. They're predators. And it's, you know, and then there were other people like, oh, I'm going to keep my cat indoors or, you know, cats should only be kept inside. And it's just, it really touches a nerve with people. It really um, does. And yeah. I have that in um, the segment of my little slideshow presentation too. Um, yes. And that was something that took us a while um, at Wild Care to um, learn how to bring up because we don't, we really don't want folks to feel like they can't, they're going to be made to feel bad if they come here with an animal that their cat has caught, right? Like we understand, right. um, we understand that and we want people to feel comfortable to bring their animals here. Um, and yes, it does touch on a lot of nerves. We also got a lot of comments and arguments happening. And um, again, it's just a topic we would like for people to talk about um, and learn about um, and hopefully affect a positive change. When we were um, on the day of the photo shoot, you know, Wild Care, we, we took over the museum. We made quite a mess in there with all of my gear and then the actual setup and the tables full of the animals and everything. And some people walked in and were, you know, hey, what's going on? We had blocked off the area so we could work, but we they could see what we were doing or wondered what we were doing. Did There was somebody there that had you spoke to, is that right? Yes, that to me um, was one of the most uh, rewarding parts of this, the starting this project because I've been telling my coworkers, my family and people about this project that I've wanted to do for years, especially when we finally started collecting all of the bodies in the freezer. And everyone was like, I don't know. I. I cannot see what you're talking about. Um, but that day when you were in the museum, that the time lapse that you showed of laying down the bodies and seeing the sheer number, a woman and her husband were in the museum. This was pre-COVID, so we had people mm -hmm. walking through the museum in the courtyard visiting. And she asked what we were doing, and we explained it. And she was just, wow, all of these animals just from this year 
just here just from cats like she was flabbergasted and, mm -hmm. and i said yeah and we explained it and she actually um had two outdoor cats at the time and she purchased one of our bird our bird safe collars um, and then also hired um, a gentleman that we recommend to build a catio and mm -hmm. so just from coming in and seeing the the carnage um firsthand uh she changed just right there on the spot and now her cats are indoor cats with with a catio and so that was shocking and i don't know reaffirming that we were you know doing the right thing and getting the right, right. message out that's a great story yeah I think you're going to show some more details about how some of the solutions in your deck. Your okay, is it time for me to? Yeah. Do my stuff? All right, I will go on there. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so, for those of you who are not local, WildCare is a nonprofit wildlife rehabilitation hospital um, based in San Rafael, California, which is just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And we um, have nature education programs. Um, where we used to take kids out for hikes and um, do school programs. Again, COVID has put a kibosh on that, but we now have fantastic virtual online education programs. Um, we have a wildlife solution service to help people humanely deal with wildlife conflict. Uh, we also have a Hungry Owl Project where we sell barn owl boxes and bat boxes um, and different programs like that. So um, let's see. In our hospital, we are a nonprofit. We don't get state or federal funding. We're run with uh, donations and money that we earn from grants and different fundraisers, um, and also running our education programs. Um, we have a staff of only 25, and we have a volunteer staff of over 230. Um, again, COVID has cut that a lot right now, and we're learning how to deal um, with a lot fewer um, hands to help on site. Um, so my job in the wildlife hospital, uh, as Jack talked about earlier, uh, we treat between three and around 3,000 animals, injured and orphaned wild animals a year that are brought to our hospital um, that we treat for release back into the wild. So only wild animals, no domestics or exotics. Um, the patients are brought to us from the public or our animal control officers, and they come to us because of usually negative human interaction, not always intentional. So like hit by car, somebody cuts down a tree, didn't realize there was a nest of baby squirrels in it. Um, or of course, caught by cat, which is what we're talking about today. These are some baby scrub jays um, for those of you who aren't in California. <laughs> um, and for the photo that we Jack did, um, there were 321 caught by cat patients brought to our hospital um, in 2019. Only 89 survived despite our best efforts. So the photo um, that Jack has is of the 232 deceased. Um, and let's see, we can't explain, <laughs> I can't explain how defeating it is to have these animals come in day after day after day in my hands, the suffering and the carnage to try to fix them with uh, something Jack already said was something that's completely preventable. So that was, again, my motivation um, for this, for getting this um, information out to people um, in a way that is not as gory as reality, um, but a way that, again, will touch the heartstrings and get people to realize there's a different way to um, affect change. Um, so our photo, again, is just one year just at our hospital. So again, Jack said some staggering numbers and it is pretty impressive. Um, that is um, to think of what's happening across the country, not just here at Wild Care. Um, it's very important to note, we've said it twice, both of us, um, that it is, this is not to demonize cat or cat owners. This is a photo of me with three of my foster kittens from Kitty Cafe uh, Rescue in San Francisco this summer. I foster for numerous rescue groups. I've never not had a cat since I was five. Um, I, we love cats. Um, again, it's just... Um, learning a new way to do things. So growing up, our cats were always indoor, outdoor. We had no idea that you should keep them inside. We spent, my sister and I spent our summers collecting tail feathers and skulls, um, and it didn't occur to us <laughs> to keep the, the, uh, the cats inside. Um, we lost two cats, were hit by car. Um, and again, it still didn't occur to us to keep cats and ties. It's just not how you did it back then. Um, but the tides are changing. Um, and I think people are really realizing it's not just for the wildlife, it's also for the cats. You, they live longer, healthier lives, not getting hit by cars, not getting in fights. Um, 
Um, so sorry, what else to say? So what solidified it for me, I knew this started working at a wildlife hospital, um, seeing this information, but really solidified it was learning the predator prey situation. Everybody always says, well, cats are natural predators. It's fine. They should be able to kill the wildlife and they shouldn't make it if they got killed. It's really not, um, in, in the wild. The prey predators, uh, the prey species, let's say rabbits and predators, we have hawks. One season, there'll be a bunch of rabbits and a huge population. So the hawks will have a lot to eat. They'll um, breed a lot and have a lot of babies. They'll be very successful. They'll eat more rabbits. The rabbit numbers will go down. Um, the hawks will eventually have to leave and find new territories. Um, and while they are gone or starved because there's not enough food, that gives the rabbit population time to come up. And that's natural. It's always ebbing and flowing with the predator and prey. Um, but you introduce cats and cats are a constant. They're in the same territory for like 20 years and more just keep getting added. They domestics and wildlife don't co-evolve together. That would that takes hundreds of years and they don't have the same pressures on them as the wildlife does. Um, so once I realized that it's not actually natural, <laughs> um, that was kind of the nail in the coffin for me to realize I needed um needed to get into this full force. Um, so my cats are all house cats now. Um, so solutions. So I want to run through some solutions really quick for you guys. Um, I know not all the solutions are work for everybody, um, but ca uh, keeping your cats indoors like these guys here is obviously the easiest, but a lot of cats can't be kept indoors. They will tear the place up. Um, they're feral and wild. So in that situation, this is my kitty. This is Katie on a harness and a leash. You can harness and leash. Um, certain cats. For those who just absolutely have to go outside because they're tearing out your house, there are these bird be safe collars, which sometimes can work. They're better than nothing. Um, and uh, one thing I wanted to say with that is bells don't work. Um, so bells are a problem because cats learn how to walk without ringing them. And then if you have a baby like this little fledgling robin, they can't fly yet. So even if they hear the cat coming, they still can't get away. So um, bells are not usually... Um, a good solution or not a good solution. But um, the other thing you can think about is only letting your cat out, um, not at the busiest time. So dawn and dusk is when wildlife is most busy, especially in the spring and summer during baby season. So keeping them in during those times. And if you have a nest of any babies that you know are active, you just can't let them out during that time. And then my favorite and final solution is the catio. This is a photo of my house with my catio and my spoiled cat. Um, catios are fantastic. She has a little doggy door from the garage that she can come in and out as much as she wants. Um, and you can have one as small as a window box or as large as this. You're only limited by your um, finances and your creations um, and your space. So um, those are all different solutions that people can work on. Uh, to keep the animals, the wildlife safe and the cats as well. Um, and one last note as I, um, as I finish up is I just like to tell people that, again, this took a, this is an evolution for myself over years as well. It's not, we know it's not going to be an overnight change. We just want people to know there's things that they can do to help. And then if this particular cat you have right now isn't one that you can make an indoor cat, then the next one, um, hopefully that you can. Um, and again, is to keep not just the wildlife safe, but also your cats to live longer. And I think that that is all that I have. Thank you to Jack and Melanie for telling us about the really important work that you do. Um, I want to do some shout outs. Uh, we have uh, comments and hellos from Elizabeth, Deanna and Diane from California. So hello from Cal like local in California. Um, hello to Nancy, who is watching from North Carolina. Um, and that's special to me because I used to live in North Carolina. And a very special hello to Kerry, who's sending koala hugs from Sydney. And I also used to live in Sydney, so I love all that those connections. So right now we're going to take a smaller lens on nature and we're going to look at the tiny critters in your home. Uh, and the person who's going to lead us is Academy scientist and curator of entomology, Dr. Michelle Trapwine. As a botanist, I never really thought about the insects in my house as biodiversity, 
but Michelle is going to convince you about the nature in your home. So over to you, Michelle. Hi, thank you, Natalie. Um, so this theme of humans and nature is one of my favorite things to think about. And it's, it's kind of a conundrum the way humans often see ourselves as very set apart from the natural world and, and not a part of nature. And in some ways I think um, it stems from the fact that as a species, we're very unique in our ability to transform environments. And um, one second. Yeah, so you know we have this just incredible ability to make our ecosystems our own in, in some ways. Um, and our houses are a part of that. So humans have been building houses for just about 20,000 years, which is actually relatively recent in our evolutionary history. Um, and now we spend the majority of our time in these indoor spaces. And I think, I think that gives us this, this sense of separateness, or at least enhances that sense of separateness from nature uh, and, and sort of uh, keeps us from recognizing that we're animals on the planet. But of course, we aren't separate from nature. Uh, and the arthropods in our daily lives are a reminder of that. So arthropods are insects and their relatives. So insects and spiders and millipedes and centipedes and anything with an exoskeleton and a lot of legs. And so for the past eight years or so, I've been studying the diversity of arthropods in houses all over the world. And I think when most people think about the bugs they may find in their house, they think about the pest species like cockroaches and termites. Um, but the truth is there's actually tens of millions of arthropod species on the planet. Um, many of them find their way into your house and the vast, vast majority of them are not pest species at all. So in my research, I like to focus on this human arthropod interface uh, that largely goes unrecognized by humans. And so uh, now we've collected uh, arthropods and houses from all over the world, from here in San Francisco to um, Sweden and the Peruvian Amazon and uh, Natalie's backyard in uh, the Australian bush. Not literally her backyard, I just mean, because she's also from Australia. Um, so tonight I'm gonna tell you just five of the most interesting things that uh, we've discovered about the arthropods living in your houses. And the first is that there's just a ton of them, really, in every house. You know, we've sampled over 100 houses at this point, and there has not been a single house where we did not find arthropods. I don't think there's been a single room that didn't have arthropods in them. So um, arthropods living with us indoors is an inevitable part of human life uh, on the planet. So in most houses, we find on average over 100 different species of arthropods, 100 different kinds. Uh, and here's kind of a, a general breakdown. So we find a ton of flies, which is really exciting to me as a fly scientist. Um, the most, we, flies are the most diverse group uh, of uh, arthropods living in our houses. Next, we find a lot of spiders, a lot of beetles, including carpet beetles that's shown here. Uh, a lot of ants and wasps, mostly tiny wasps, and then a whole wide array of, of other types of arthropods. But what you'll notice here is there's not a lot of really obvious pest species. So my next favorite thing that we've discovered about the arthropods in your houses is that the most common bugs in your house are species or groups that you've never even heard of. And that's exciting to me because people, uh, I think, generally have a negative opinion of the arthropods in their houses. Um, and at the same time, they don't even know, <laughs> they don't even know which creatures are, are living there and, and probably haven't even noticed the most common ones. Uh, so for example, uh, the, here's eight of the most common things found in, in houses, and this is in the US, although these groups are found uh, globally. Um, and the first one is a, a picture there uh, to the upper, upper. oh, you can see my mouse, good, okay, uh, is, a, is called a gall midge. So it's a tiny fly, a microscopic almost little fly, not quite microscopic, but a very small little fly. And it, um, 
we find tons of them in houses. If, if I look at a windowsill that looks like it's just been wiped down, often if I look closer, I'll find you know three or four little gall midges on there. Um, and so gall midges are kind of like plankton in the air. They just float, float in. Um, and so they may not be in houses intentionally, but uh, they are definitely in every house we've ever sampled. Next, there are ants, tons of ants in houses. Uh, after that, carpet beetles. As I mentioned, uh, carpet beetles are a group we almost always find in houses all over the world from you know, your apartment in San Francisco to the Thatch Ruth Hut uh, in the Peruvian Amazon. Carpet beetles are, are tiny little beetles that love to eat organic matter. And mostly we find their babies, which are adorable furry headed little grubs. Um, next, a lot of cobweb spiders in houses. Uh, dark wing fungus gnats, which again, I mean, have you ever heard anyone complain about the dark wing fungus gnats in their house? This, these are, these are uh, pretty benign creatures. Cellar spiders are another group that we find in most houses. And these are spiders that are really intentionally inside indoor structures. So again, a lot of things come in and out uh, and these cellar spiders are, are there in, intentionally. Um, scuttle flies, another group of uh, little known flies that uh, are, are common in houses. And then my favorite um, are book lice. So down here, that's a, a book louse. Most people don't realize they're living with lice in their house, not head lice, fortunately, but tiny little book lice, which are uh, also adorable little scavengers that are very common in houses all over the world. So the arthropods in our houses aren't just, you know, pesky roommates. They're actually storytellers that can inform us about our past. And in particular, they tell us about ancient migrations and more recent movement around the planet by humans. So for example, here are two very common characters that you may find in your house. The first one is a house fly. These are both beloved flies. Um, house flies uh, are gonna be coming in and outside of your house and they're attracted to your garbage. Um, and then next to that is a tiny little fruit fly or a drosophilid. These are um, famous model organisms in science. We know so much of what we know about human genetics because of this tiny little fly. But also this fly it, uh, may come buzz around your wine glass or around your fruit bowl. It likes to eat fermented bits. Um, and like us, both of these flies have origins in Africa. Um, and as humans spread around the world uh, 65,000 years ago and, and since, these two flies followed us. So they've literally crossed oceans to be with us because they love our trash and our food and our way of life. And, um, and so these, these flies have made ancient migrations with us and, and remind us of our origins in Africa. Here's a more recent um, uh, migrant. This is uh, local to many of you. This is a three-lined cockroach that's often called the Marin cockroach because uh, it became very common in Marin about 10 years ago. And I love it, it's my favorite cockroach in California, even though it's a new uh, transplant, much like myself. And um, this cockroach came from the Middle East. And so when it was first found in Marin, no one knew where it was from. It was a big mystery, it took a lot of effort uh, for entomologists to track it down, but it seems like it came from imports from the Middle East. So these uh, arthropods that we find in our houses have big stories behind them of, of how, how they came to uh, live in our uh, bedrooms and kitchens and, and bathrooms. So, uh, and that gets to this next point that there's really an ecosystem in your house. So it's not just a sterile indoor space, your, uh, your house is actually an indoor ecosystem. And in fact, we find um, a food web or trophic structure in almost every room of every house we sample, which means that we find predators like this house centipede, or this beautiful spitting spider. And we also find prey species. So a lot of arthropods that end up uh, like ill-fated tourists hopping in the windows or doors and getting stuck and dying, but they provide a food source to a lot of those uh, spiders and other top predators uh, in your living room. And also tiny little parasitoids. This is a little baby, it's not a baby, it's an adult, but it is a tiny, tiny little wasp that parasitizes um, pest species of insects in your house. So a very cool, very cool life histories uh, and, and, uh, and dramatic predation is happening in your house. 
I'm going to skip ahead. Um, the, the fifth thing that we found is that, that I think is fascinating, is that houses in wealthier neighborhoods often host more types of arthropods indoors. And we were surprised by this, but it actually um, is a common phenomenon known as the luxury effect that's been found for plants and all kinds of animals in urban areas. And this is a, a picture of a, a city. I think this is a, a city in Brazil, um, a Google satellite view. And what it shows is that wealthier neighborhoods in, um, often have more vegetation than lower income neighborhoods. And you can find this trend in almost every major city in the world uh, using um, these Google satellite images. And so what's interesting is that these social inequities have ramifications that we don't often foresee. Uh, and you may not think that it's a benefit to have more types of arthropods in your house <laughs> in, in a wealthier neighborhood. But the truth is that uh, research has shown that by bringing more of the outdoors in, it actually helps build a growing immune system. Uh, and it uh, seems to uh, possibly prevent things like asthma or other allergic syndromes. And so connection to the outdoors is actually really beneficial to our health, even if it comes in the form of potentially indoor arthropods. And so the last uh, thing that I wanted to share with you all is that you can actually help up us make discoveries in your house. We have a global study that we've done. We actually went to houses all over the world and sampled on our hands and knees, but we want your help and people all over the world now can use iNaturalist and go to this uh, link uh, to look up our project and make observations of the arthropods in your house. So right now we have about 16,000 observations and we're gonna stop our sampling when we get 20,000 observations and hopefully, um, hopefully then pull together a, a cool study about the global diversity of arthropods in houses observed by, by people like you. And I can give you a little hint that so far, what I've seen in houses all over the world is that humans make a really unique indoor ecosystem uh, that's made in part by our shed hair and skin, which builds the dust all over our houses. And it seems to create uh, a similar uh, indoor ecological dynamic uh, all over the world, wherever humans are. Um, so go online and, and help us um, finish this cool study of arthropods in our houses all over the world. And here is the team of people that have helped me pull together this research over the years, um, which has been a, a, a long indoor global adventure. And that's it for me. Thank you all for, for watching and thinking about the ways that humans are, are still connected to nature. Thank you, Michelle. And we're going to drop that link um, into our comments section. So if you want to help Michelle by survey, surveying your homes, um, you can join in and help science at the Academy. We want to give a shout out to Jean, who, um, who could be part of Michelle's study, who told us that the eight-year-old just realised that her mystery bug was, um, in fact, a carpet beetle. But before tonight, had just decided um, or named them a rug bug. And so we're really excited that you've learned something tonight um, and have found a name for your mystery bug. So hello to Jean. Um, and please keep giving us shout outs in the comments. We love to know where you're watching from um, and we want, want to know about your exciting discoveries through tonight. If you want to learn more about Michelle's work, there's a breakfast club that Michelle did a few weeks ago. Um, and there's also her lab website called flylogeny.com. Um, there's links to her uh, appearance on PBS, a TV show called Nova, and to Science Friday. And you can learn about the nature on your body, which is, in fact, face mites, another really fascinating area of research that Michelle does. So next, I want to introduce someone that I'm very excited to uh, see. And I've been following her on Instagram for quite a while as Inkdwell. And this is Jane Kim, and she melds science, art, and nature. Um, and her work is absolutely stunning. She does indoor murals um, and outdoor murals, 
And tonight she's going to tell us about a mural that she did in San Francisco about monarch butterflies. Over to you, Jane, thank you. Hi, I think I'm live now. It's so exciting to be here and thank you so much Cal Academy for inviting me tonight. Um, I will be speaking about the migrating mural and um, thinking about tonight's topic, human and nature is uh, just absolutely critical to the work that we do here at Israel. So here we go. Oh. All right, I'm starting off with this slide. Um, cliche tea bag quotes are not how I normally navigate life, but when I began thinking about tonight's topic, human nature, this quote absolutely came to mind. Um, and it says, the difference between a flower and a weed is a judgment. And when I reflect on the question, are humans a part of or separate from nature? It often feels like the answer is the same. Um, I think it depends on how you look at it and how you look at it often shapes your actions. And personally, I absolutely believe that we are a part of nature and that we can live fully connected to it. And uh, I have devoted my art practice to creating public art that explores the wonders of the natural world. Um, and I hope that my work helps humanity form a deeper connection and understanding to nature and in doing so, um, help us to better understand ourselves. Uh, tonight, I will quickly share on um, an ongoing Inkwell public art project called The Migrating Mural. And The Migrating Mural is a series of art installations painted along migration corridors they share with people. Um, it began with the Sierra Nevada Bighorn Sheep. And during this project, we created six unique murals along Highway 395 in the Eastern Sierra, from Levining to 100 mile, 125 miles south to Lone Pine to bring attention to an elusive animal nearly driven to extinction in the 90s uh, because of disease spread by domestic sheep. Um, but fortunately today, the population has been recovered to about 600 sheep. And here is the first mural painted in the series. And this one still means so much to me for a number of reasons. But one of the most meaningful memories uh, was getting a phone call from a resident in her 60s who had lived in Independence her entire life and said that she never knew Bighorn Sheep lived in this mountain range until this mural. Um, so that impact that um, public art can have and just, just helping opening uh, someone's eyes to what's in their surrounding environment is uh, something I hope that the Migrating Mural will continue to do. Oh, by the way, I am keeping track of um, comments that come in, so if there is a question or if I or see something pop up, I'm more than happy to, to sidetrack and, and answer. So our next um, species that we're highlighting focuses on the monarch butterfly. And we began this uh, project in 2017. Um, like the Sierra Bighorn, monarchs are facing a very similar path towards extinction. Um, and one of the reasons we chose the monarch butterfly as our next subject is because people can actually easily make a big and direct impact on monarch um, populations by planting native nectar producing plants in their gardens. So it was something that I felt we could really easily all collectively do. And if I can bring beautiful, wondrous imagery that gets people excited about butterflies, um, perhaps that they will be inspired to then do something to, to help these animals. Um, and with each mural, uh, many of our partners have made an effort to create habitat for monarchs. I'm just gonna quickly run through some of the uh, murals from this project. This is in Springdale, Arkansas. This mural is called Kaleidoscope. Um, it is painted at Springdale's regional airport and it has a sort of an infinity of butterflies um, spiraling around um, a, a, a caterpillar um, eating on their host plant milkweed. Um, and in this case, the common milkweed. And once again, uh, one of the cool things about this project was being able to collaborate and partner with conservation organizations. So there's a great group called Springdale from uh, Monarchs for Springdale, um, and they plant wayfinding stations all throughout the city. And this one happened to have an elementary school across from the airport that 
uh, had a way station there. So um, bringing this mural to that particular location was really special. Following this mural was in, um, in Arkansas, was in Florida. This is in uh, Winter Park. Sorry, just had a little moment there. Winter Park, Florida at Full Sail University. Um, this piece is uh, called Milkweed Galaxy. Um, and I, I called it that because while I was standing next to this giant uh, milkweed, it just really felt like an entire universe um, could be explored uh, just in this milkweed itself. Um, I have a question here. Have you ever used recycled salvage materials in your art? Yes, I actually have. Um, I was really proud to be a artist in residence at San Francisco's Recology in 2009. And at that time, I was actually using uh, construct construction scrap like drywall to paint on. So thank you, Elizabeth Cass, for that question. Um, and once again, our uh, Full Sail partners planted, um, I think you might be able to see in this picture, just some young milkweed starting to grow in their garden. And they, they completely took out the hedges that were there and replaced it with, uh, with milkweed. Our next mural was also in Florida, but this time in Orlando, just a neighboring um, major city. And uh, this is right in their downtown area across from their civic center. This piece, piece is called Midnight Dream. And just after that, uh, we were really fortunate to be able to bring the migrating mural to uh, Ogden, Utah. And we actually did three unique installations there. I'm only actually going to share two today, but um, that was quite a special uh, way to be able to create a story around monarch butterflies and um, art history. This was for their Nine Rails Creative Art District, um, and it's influenced by a movement in the 60s called Op Art. Um, I really love the graphic quality of the wings and the butterfly and the spots and you know, just wanted to make the butterflies otherworldly and um, bring out the graphic and, and beautiful uh, colors and, and patterns of the monarch butterfly. Also in Ogden at Weber State University was um, a piece called Generations for their, their college um, in the art department. Um, and this piece was, was really to celebrate scientific illustration, which is uh, one of my backgrounds. Um, I have a BFA in printmaking um, and also a degree in science illustration. Um, and I was so proud to work with Weber State. And in the following years, they ended up planting two acres of milkweed on their campus, which is just one of the most incredible things that we could have seen happen uh, with this project. So thank you, Weber State, for giving so much habitat to not only monarchs, but all kinds of pollinators and insects. And finally, um, I'm skipping ahead to our murals here in San Francisco, um, which of course has become one of the most meaningful uh, murals to date, not only because this is where I live, but it allowed me to expand a little bit on the story outside of Monarch Butterflies to really talk about um, butterflies of San Francisco. So this is located uh, on, I'm sorry, on Howard Street between 5th and 6th. And this piece is called Our Families. And here on California Phacelia, which is of course a, a native nectar producing plant, um, are the five different families that you can find here. We've got the skippers on the top left, we got the whites on the bottom, we got brush footed butterflies in the middle, which is the monarch. Uh, we have the um, the gossamer winged butterfly represented by the green hair streak and uh, the swallowtails, which is represented here by um, the pipe vine swallowtail. Um, and each of these butterflies I chose, um, where, sorry, I'm just looking at these comments. Steve Brown, where in the Bay Area can I get milkweed? Um, that is a great question. Um, I'm, there are nurseries all around California that focus on, on native um, plants, um, Xerxes Society, which, is in fact uh, one of our conservation partners for the San Francisco murals, um, has a wonderful database for regional uh, native plants. So I would highly recommend shooting over to their website to check out what they might recommend for, for your area. Thank you, Steve, for that question. 
Um, and I, I wanted to definitely include the green hair streak butterfly and uh, the pipeline because I wanted to give shout outs to two ways that people and um, urban settings um, can really coexist beautifully together. The first is a shout out to nature in the city. Um, they have created a number of amazing stairwell corridor. Um, there's a green hair streak corridor um, in San Francisco for specifically these butterflies. Um, so I wanted to uh, just take a second in this mural to highlight that wonderful story. They have also another initiative called Tigers on Market. Um, so if you haven't heard of Nature in the City, I definitely recommend checking their work out and all the fabulous ways they've contributed to connecting humanity and nature. Um, the Pipeline Swallowtail has a beautiful story. Um, I was inspired by Tim Wong, uh, who is actually um, a staff and member and scientist here at the California Academy of Sciences, um, who brought back the, the pipevine swallowtail by, um, create, by planting uh, the host plant, the pipevine, in his backyard and re-releasing these beautiful butterflies. And now you can enjoy um, the pipevine swallowtail at the botanical garden. Um, and it's really honestly one of the things that brings me so much joy um, to see these butterflies fluttering around the garden. So finally, um, we recently finished uh, this building in uh, January of this year. Um, well, no, actually, that's not true, February. <laughs> so this side, um, it's and it's kind of a sculptural piece because uh, we painted uh, all, well, three sides of the four sides of this building. Um, and I chose this particular shot um, because it really felt so monumental and it changed the skyline of San Francisco. And, you know, in doing the Migrating Mural Project, um, I had always thought of these murals as monuments to wildlife. Um, and I think that Monuments have an interesting place in our current history, as, as, as we know, um, there's been a lot of, I guess, reevaluation of what kind of monuments should be up. Um, and, in, and in thinking about that, you know, we, we have monuments to uh, war leaders, we have monuments to a lot of things, um, but not so many monuments to nature. And so I kind of felt like the migrating mural was was that, and um, this when I first saw this drone shot, um, it really kind of stopped me in my tracks because I said, "Well, here here it is. Here's this monument to the monarch butterfly here in San Francisco." And on the other side of that building, again, we represented um, all five families of uh, San Francisco butterflies, and in it, you'll see there is one butterfly that no, you can no longer see here in San Francisco. Um, it's the Xerxes blue. And this is the namesake butterfly for the Xerxes um, organization. And uh, I think that that is a poignant story, especially for, for this building. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do in this particular project was to really highlight the architecture. And I was thinking about the Victorian architecture that is iconic to San Francisco and thinking about the Victorian era and the co collecting in the Victorian era of butterflies and, and what that meant today and our impact that we had during that time period of you know, how we valued and saw nature as just these sort of collectible items um, and hoping that we can somehow move away from that. And so to, and once again, inspired by the sort of Victorian um, storyline, uh, the interior of the, the residence archway is now flanked with all 34 butterflies of San Francisco that you might be able to observe today. Here is the left and the right side. And then on the street level, um, we have all 34 of those butterflies um, so that when people walk by, they can uh, see this beautiful garage door and stop and take a second to really study all of the butterflies that they might be able to observe in nature. 
So as we continue our work um, at Intwell, you know, I, I really look forward to exploring new ways our work can perhaps you know, shift, shift our attitudes closer to seeing ourselves as part of nature. And that in seeing nature depicted boldly and iconically in our urban settings, uh, urban settings, we will be able to see actual nature more easily and perhaps be inspired to know nature so that we can better live within it. Um, so that is the migrating mural in a nutshell. Um, thank you again so much for inviting me and allowing me to share my work with all of you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much, Jane. And please do follow her on Instagram as Inkdwell. Um, I guarantee you will love seeing all her images. So you can also help nature by planting native plants. And Teresa let us know that the California Native Plant Society sales are coming up soon. So you can plant some native plants to help uh, the butterflies and nature around you. Um, and I love that we have our collective um, mind helping us with all of these um, issue, issues and letting us know what's happening um, all around us. And I wanted to give some shout outs to some of our viewers. So hello to Diana from San Rafael, to Judy from Fremont, Arpit from Cupertino, Sandy from Burbank, and a special hello to Ir Irwin who is um, in Washington. So another person to follow on Instagram is Gab Miha. Gab is a conservationist, a photographer, a National Geographic explorer, and most excitingly for us, I don't know if that's a word, excitingly, um, he is our first ever international guest. And he's gonna tell us about conservation of wetlands in his home country in the Philippines. Thank you, Gab. Hi everyone, so I'm very thankful to be here right now. My name is Gab, I'm 23, year old, 23 years old and I'm a photographer and a conservation photographer working on stories about nature, the environment and all, especially the vulnerable communities and people who are affected most by these changes happening in our environment. So today I'll be talking about actually a very, store, a close story to my heart which is about a place, the largest wetland in the Philippines called the Agusan Marshlands found in Agusan in the south of southern region of the Philippines. And particularly this story is not just about the wetlands itself, but our country, because our country, the Philippines is, if you don't know where it is, I'm currently here at, there in the middle of the ocean uh, beside the Pacific and we are an archipelago of 7,600 islands, and we're a mega biodiverse country. But sadly, we're also the second most vulnerable country for climate risk, and we have the top. Uh, we are the top one last year for the deadliest country for environmental defenders. So it's not really a fun thing, a uh, fun thing right now, in terms of our environment in the Philippines. So many risks, so many threats happening day in and day out. But today I'm gonna to be particularly talking about a story uh, about this indigenous community, a, a close indigenous community called the Manobo tribe who have lived and was born in this marsh and their cultures, their way of life all coexisted with this balance of nature and how much we can learn from them. Because you know, we're not here, they're not voiceless. We're only here to amplify their voices because they're being unheard, they are being silenced in the, the world of social economic development and the effects and risks of climate change. So this place is actually, the, again, the largest wetland in the Philippines and considerably the second largest peatland swamp forest in Asia, the whole of Asia. So it's a complex system of lakes, rivers, marshes, swamps, peatlands. And it is really, I consider it like the Okavango of Asia. It's like the the largest wetland and a very ecological significant place in my country. But more than all, the biodiversity, the hundreds of species of birds that migrate from Japan and Russia all the way to its waters, this place shares home to a beautiful community that we can learn so much from and how to balance 
humanity and nature and how we could actually live and coexist. They are called the Manobo tribe. This is Tess, Tess Babanto. She is an indigenous chieftain, woman chieftain leader of the Manobo tribe. And she has dedicated her life, her whole life in protecting this marsh, the Agusan marsh from threats of palma plantations, of mining companies, and all those other threats from plastic pollution coming in from the downstream of the rivers. And their way of life really revolves around the seasons of the marsh, of how it's flooded, of how they use their canoes to go to food, to get food, to go to their neighbor, to even go around different parts of this whole ecosystem. They clean their clothes here, they eat here, they get their water here. They even have, and even like their children are born here in, this floating, in, this, in these floating houses. And one of the most amazing things is about the children, the, the indigenous youth who are adapting to the way of life, the new way of life because of the climate crisis that is currently happening in our backyard. And especially the, the leaders, we call them the Datu. This is Datu Lucrecio. And he safeguards one of the most protected areas in the Philippines in a place called Lake Benuni, a very sacred lake where, where they still hold traditions and uh, cultures, rituals, sacrificial rituals in order to actually ask permission and to actually pray for blessings from the marsh and from their forefathers. So what they do is they actually offer this native boar and they spear it with a, uh, a spear that was passed down from their forefathers. So it's very a bit gruesome, but um, it's really meant to offer and give a blessing to the swamps for protecting them, for them not to get flooded in the next weeks or so on. So what they do is they, they get the blood and they actually wipe it on their hands and the palms of their hands and the soles of their feet. And this blood is very, very sacred because these rituals are actually made to honor and revere the saltwater crocodiles that lives in the marsh. Their clothes are actually based off uh, the spikes of the clothes, as you can see from the red, white, and yellow colors and braidments. It's actually the spines of the crocodiles that they revere. And what they do is they actually hold a feast. They kill the boar and they offer a blessing by the Datu, by the leader, and they cook it and they give the food to everyone in the community. So it's really a very community-based community, community based and very close-knit close, close -knit, uh, tribe. But sadly, again, because of the risks of climate change, last year I was there to document the, the one of the largest recorded peat fires, peatland fires there in this Agusan Marsh complex. And about 100 hectares were burnt out of existence. So that's about 140 football fields that were burnt out of existence because um, the threats and the threats of palm oil plantation companies wanting to actually make the land more fertile for crops, for monoculture, for rice. But you know, and last year there were like three perpetrators that we captured actually in the middle of this fire that were dis destroying the peatlands. And as we all know, peatlands are actually very, very important in uh, adapting to climate change, they absorb three times more. Um, they absorb three times more carbon than our, the total area of our world's forests. And this heart of the marsh has really affected them because these cultures really depend on the environment that they live in. They were born here, and they haven't contributed so much to the effects that we're having because of this climate crisis. But they're the most vulnerable to the changes that are happening. And last year also, there was a huge drought that happened, uh, causing the weather patterns to change and no rain would fall within one, a month and causing the whole landscape to change into a dry land, leaving their culture, leaving the canoes, the barotos in local language. And sadly, because of the droughts, the rivers are also changing, the tributaries, the lakes are drying up, causing major water hyacinth blooms wherein it's so harder for the children, for the people to actually navigate now around the marsh. It would take them about four hours round trip 
just to get fresh, clean water for drinking. And of course, it's not just the people who are affected, but also nature, our animals, these migratory species, um, migratory species like this night crown heron who have succumbed to the changing climate. But this world is really an amazing, like if you go into the marsh and you can know and you go meet the, uh, the communities, they have really safeguarded it and they revere all the animals and they know the importance of this even without all the education that we receive from sciences or not. They have their own way of respect for nature and that's what's so mesmerizing and what's so amazing about the Manobo tribe and how their youth, the indigenous youth, are really connected with the nature and being sadly being affected directly by it because of the constructions that are happening, because of the mining, because of the palm oil plantations. And sadly, you know, their future is at stake because of our ever-changing world. How honestly, we only have two ways, the left and the right in this picture of showing a juxtaposition of the future that we deserve and the future that we don't want. But sadly, again, these people don't have the choices. They don't have the privilege that we do to get to speak. And I hope to, uh, to, to give them that chance to be able to, sh to share their voice that in, th in this world, in this changing world, because of the climate change, because of droughts, they, they are part of this bigger picture, even if they are the most affected. And you know, this place is really amazing. One is still one of the most pristine landscapes here in the Philippines. And slowly the land is enroaching closer and closer and destroying the trees and destroying the birds and the world that they knew for centuries long ago. So this story was actually shared with National Geographic and we distributed it to many uh, people all around the world. But what's amazing is not just that these are not just stories or printed magazines, but these could be tools used for change and actually conserving the place and conserving the place and protecting the people from threats that they are currently facing. So last year, we also, in World Wetlands Day, actually this year, before the pandemic, because of this story, we were able to connect with international partners and organizations in bringing safer water to these communities, clean, accessible water. And this is Tess, at the right, the photo is Tess Babanto, who, who again is the, the one, the indigenous chief, woman chieftain leader of this tribe, particular tribe in Agusan. And she is just so amazed of what, how a story could change their world. And this is how we could, we should show how much valuable their voices are in this bigger picture between finding the coexistence between man and nature. So thank you so much. That's all for me. And I'm really honored to be here. And I hope we get to share more stories about the world that we live in. Thank you so much to Gab, who came from us, I guess, from the future, who was talking um, in the, he was talking from the Philippines, um, where it's Friday morning. Um, and that was a really important topic where wetlands are often overlooked for conservation. So thank you, Gab. If you want to learn more about Gab's work, you can check out his website, um, and there's many more stunning photos that he's taken. Our final guest for tonight also has a Philippine connection. We have Ruby Ibarra and she's a Filipina American. She's a fellow Californian, also in the Bay Area, and she's a fellow scientist who is working on COVID. She's founded a nonprofit to support Filipinos in their education, and she's a talented and very accomplished musician, rapper, and music producer. So tonight she'll be performing two pieces. One is entitled Someday, and then the second piece is called Here. So over to you, Ruby. Thank you. You're all watching the virtual nightlife, and my name is Ruby Ibarra. I 
wrote this album cause I want my life to change Tired of being short changed, I'm trying to remain sane Hopped off the plane, didn't stop all the pain My father's still in debt and we've been struggling to pay For a bedroom up on me Flynn Ave Reaching for just meat and have hands tied against the odds How you gonna even that? People from the slums once, now live in the humdrum Mama from the body, so we dream where we can stunt once Mama, I know it's gonna be five or wherever we go Cause we know your race is full of dream and be a hero What's an ego? to an equal? I free flow when I speak though My pipe dream is through people My skin's so Filipino Oftentimes my pride inside is in high tides Nay, we broke the ocean But today you'll learn to know Stop, close eyes, fingerprint ink With the most die Those times mama never blinks Save the old twice I said mama we gon' make it there someday I said mama we gon' make it there someday I said mama we gon' make it there someday I said mama we gon' make it there someday I said mama we gon' make it here Yeah, I said mama we gon' make it here Uh, I said mama we gon' make it here Yeah, I said mama we gon' make it here we gon' make it this day, I feel the sun's rays open up my eyes, I feel brave Cause I once made a promise to myself that I'm a vessel So it's one way that I'ma take up space until I'm done Let the song play, my friends say unpaid These days be the worst days, we pray They lay more cases at a worse rate Help us find a way, we rise up, carry this way Frontliners lead the way, and we thank you for the risks made Worst case, fixed ways, fixed wage, missed days But this case, this race, the Cloven City, birth place, circa 91, cause we immigrants in this place, gentrified this place, stayed alive in this race, took a plane this way, across the ocean this way, settled in the bay, so I hit him with the this face, grew up in a way that I knew myself I can't wait for another day to rise, so we'll make it someday. Mama, we gon' make it there someday. I said, Mama, we gon' make it there someday. I said, Mama, we gon' make it there someday. I said, Mama, we gon' make it there someday. I said, Mama, we gon' make it here. Yeah, I said, Mama, we gon' make it here. Uh, I said, Mama, we gon' make it here. Yeah, I said, Mama, we gon' make it here someday. My name is Ruby Yabara. You're all watching the virtual nightlife at the California Academy of Sciences. The theme tonight is the relationship between human and nature. And it's more important than ever before to trust in the science. No need for introduction, you hear when you know why I know it's diving to an era with a piece of lo-fi Put my face in the book cause my people are profiled Erased from the books and my people are told lies Guys, let me go fly, Cali, give me go high I mean back in 05, but in you I grow wise Surprise, we grow thighs, double dose of broke lies We dove in those sides to lose and hope it goes But I got fam to my left and Erica right Here to give you America like Erica right Try to take my title, never will to inherit the rights Ah, uh, got Club and City's finest Put me on the five list, pillar up the Lines, Cause I color like your iris Hunger in my eyes Just everything that I risk Killer with my tongue Every time I spit a free But the work is never done I believe I'll never leave Cause I'm here Get your hands in the air Now the greatest is here And I'ma make this my year Cause I'm finally here Yeah, yeah I'm finally here Yeah, yeah I'm finally here Yeah, yeah I'm finally here you call yourself a rapper, talk less and take notes We slay sheep, respect those who praise people next Tell Take beats to flex, throw finesse fees to bless those Say feet, say chest, don't be safe, please But stay woke, leave your cat's face To the point I catch praise Rhymes turn to catch phrase till it starts a cascade Product of Mac, Dre, Wu-Tang, and Andre Break beats on beat tapes and break next to press play They say we from the slums where the heroes never won But people always sun, brown faces of the sun Still the Satan with my tongue The spinning from the stages, rotating around the sun The axe is my match, just a pass out impact this abstract the masses, last off the practice, back to back raps, Manila Noir, Bop for Bah, homie, check the repertoire, bar with the rice and sub pro, well, let's set the bar. Cause I'm finally here. Get your hands in the air. Now the greatest is here. And I'ma make this my year. Cause I'm finally here. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm finally here. Yeah, yeah, I'm finally here. Yeah, yeah, I'm finally here. Cause I'm finally here. Get your hands in the air. Now the greatest is here. And I'ma make this my year. Cause I'm finally here. Yeah, I'm finally here. Yeah, I'm finally here. And I ain't going nowhere. Thank you so much to Ruby. That was amazing. I want to do some final shout outs for the night. I want to say hello to Matt, who is watching from Berkeley, and a very special shout out to Aaron, who's a very dedicated viewer of all our Academy live streams. So thank you for joining us, Aaron. Thank you to all our guests tonight. We've had such a wonderful lineup, and I, I hope you've all learned so much. I also want to thank our behind the scenes people, um, who are Christina and Lynn, who are working behind the scenes for, to get everything sorted out um, and who have arranged this amazing lineup. Thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. And by joining us, you're supporting the Cal Academy in our mission. Um, and this is really important since we've been closed since March. We know it's been really difficult times for all of you um, and for many of you. And so if it is possible, we would really appreciate a donation. Um, you can visit the CAS website, uh, the calacademy.org, or look at a, a link in YouTube. You can continue supporting us by coming back to join us for our live stream next Tuesday. That's going to be the Big Picture Nature Photography live stream on Tuesday, September 22nd, 5 p.m. Pacific time. And next week for Nightlife, we're going to have a special night school and we're going to learn all about sea otters and the bay. We'll learn about the past and the future of sea otters in the bay and get a very special behind the scenes look at our scientific collections of mammals. Um, and not many people get to see that. So that's going to be very special. So thank you all and see you next time. <laughs>